of the Florida Grade Level Reading Campaign, an initiative of the Florida Alliance of Children's Councils and Trusts. Our state level campaign originated in 2015 and has grown from 10 local campaigns to now 25 campaigns serving 37 counties across Florida. We're generously funded by the Helios Education Foundation and the Bainham Family Foundation and have thoughtfully utilized their collective $3.86 million in grant funding for strategic statewide system development and enhanced early learning and literacy public policy efforts. Our state campaign is deeply engaged in science of reading based literacy instruction supports during both in and out of school times, as well as we focus on critical research and data collection of summer literacy supports. Through these smart investments, we anticipate transformative change in Florida's early learning and literacy outcomes in the upcoming years. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Sierra Sanchez and I'll be behind the scenes helping to produce this conversation. Uh, we will get started here in just a second with some housekeeping tips. Okay, welcome again everyone to GLR Week 2022. I am excited to get us started by sharing a few housekeeping details. First, we would love for you to introduce yourself, so please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city, or state, and your organization. When responding, be sure to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but we encourage you to post any questions that you may have during the conversation into the Q&A box. All resources that you see linked in the chat box, as well as a recording of this webinar, will be shared in a follow-up email. Additionally, we are excited to announce that we are offering live ASL interpretation services, and you will see the interpreters on your screen for the duration of this session. We are also live streaming on our Facebook page. Additionally, we encourage you to follow the conversation on Twitter and LinkedIn using hashtag GLRWeek and hashtag bright spots silver linings and tag us at reading by third. Finally, we'll be sharing a brief poll right as we close out the conversation and highly encourage you to respond as this helps with our commitment to continuous improvement. Again, I am so excited to welcome all of you to GLR Week 2022 happening this week, July 18th through the 22nd with the theme of bright spots and silver linings. If this is the first time you're joining us or the second time this week, we do invite you to join us again tomorrow, Wednesday, July 20th to discuss digital equity at 3 p.m. Eastern time and Thursday for a conversation on community coalition leading organizations. Friday, there is an invitation collaborative conversation as well. Again, I would really love to encourage all of you to connect with us on social media. On Twitter, follow us at Reading by Third. On Facebook, like us at Campaign for GLR. And on LinkedIn, follow our conversations at Campaign for GLR. Again, encouraging you to use the hashtags GLR Week and hashtag Bright Spots Silver Linings. Now, I am excited to welcome Sarah Torian, Senior Consultant of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Sierra, and welcome everyone. We're delighted that you could all join us for today's GLR Week 2022 session as we return again to the theme of the bright spots and silver linings that have emerged during the pandemic. Over the past 30 months, it has been incredibly inspiring to see state and local leaders find innovative ways to slow, stop, and reverse learning loss and to advance equitable learning recovery. The brief video shared by Jen Faber at the opening of today's webinar describing the Florida GLR campaign's smart investments in science of reading-based literacy instruction and summer literacy supports is just one example of many that we have seen across the GLR network. With many of these innovations and actions generating measurable results for kids and families, we believe that they can and should 
be sustained through continued investments as a part of a new normal, because the data show that we need a multifaceted approach to respond to and address the challenges that children have faced over the past two and a half years. Today, we will explore some of these bright spots and silver linings and discuss the very real challenges that kids, families, and educators are uh, still facing. And to begin that conversation, I am incredibly honored to welcome and introduce our panel for today. Joining us as moderator for today's conversation is John Gomperts. John is a longtime leader in nonprofits and government organizations dedicated to civic engagement and to creating greater opportunity for children and youth. John has led America's Promise Alliance and served as director of AmeriCorps in the Obama administration and currently serves as executive fellow to the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Joining us as a presenter today is Jean-Claude Brizard. Jean-Claude serves as president and CEO of Digital Promise Global, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization focused on shaping the future of education and advancing equitable education systems by bridging solutions across research, practice, and technology. Before Digital Promise, Jean-Claude was a senior advisor and deputy director in U.S. programs at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, chief executive of Chicago Public Schools, and superintendent of schools in Rochester, New York. Welcome also to Yoli Flores. Yoli is campaign director for Building a Parent Nation, a nationwide effort to activate parents and their allies based at the TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health at the University of Chicago. Before joining Parent Nation, Yoli served as chief learning officer here at the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, supporting our efforts to ensure early school success by, uh, elevating, the, by elevating parent success. And also she helped to envision and launch the GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar series, which is enabling today's session. During her 30 year career, advancing the well-being of children and families, Yo Lee has, led, has held leadership roles in the Los Angeles Board of Education, the LA County Children's Planning Council, and the City of LA's Child Care Policy and Planning Office. I'm also delighted to welcome Jacqueline Jones back to GLR Learning Tuesdays today, currently serving as the President and CEO of the Foundation for Child Development. Jacqueline has served as a teacher, researcher and policymaker during her career, including serving as senior advisor on early learning to Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan, and as the country's first Deputy Assistant Director of Policy and Early Learning at the US DOE. She's also held leadership roles in the New Jersey DOE and Educational Testing Service. And finally, welcome to Susanna Lowe. Susanna is director of the Annenberg Institute for School Reform at Brown University, where she is also professor of education and of international and public affairs and the founder and acting executive director of the National Student Support Accelerator, which aims to expand access to relationship based high impact tutoring in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Another great example of a bright spot to lift up. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll pass the mic over to John to walk us through today's conversation. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. <clears throat> and thanks, um, Sierra always does such a terrific job putting on these, these events. So huge thanks to Sierra who works, as she says, behind the scenes. Also want to thank our ASL interpreters for joining us today and for making this come alive with their hands. That's fantastic. Um, we have fantastic guests today. And I want to just very quickly um, set out what I hope we can do over the next 90 minutes or so, 75 minutes. Uh, this is not about persuading folks that early childhood education or parent engagement or digital access um, or high touch uh, and high dosage quality tutoring is important for young people, especially coming out of the pandemic. We've been over this. I think we all agree. I think people are listening to this because they agree. The question is, how do we now execute on these good ideas with excellence? Um, we have for so many years disserved, underserved, or mediocrely served people who are growing up in challenging communities, in challenging circumstances, 
And if we want to break through for kids who are growing up in those kind of conditions, we are going to need to do not just a little bit of all these things, we're going to need to do all these things brilliantly well, brilliantly well. And we have with us people who are friends of the campaign and who are super experts in all this. So we are very, very fortunate. And we uh, these are, as I said, friends of the campaign. So we can press them a little bit. Like we don't need... Um, you know, all the correct answers. We need to know what the challenges are. We need to know what it's going to take and what role all of us from national leaders to community and state leaders to funders can do so that we can actually take advantage of the big ideas that are on the table now. So let's start with a quick, but just a quick review of the current situation. There was just a piece I thought that was um, both outstanding and depressing in, in Atlantic Magazine about just how serious the setbacks that young people uh, experienced uh, during the pandemic over the last two and a half years now have been. And um, to set the scene, I'd like to just do a quick go around of our four panelists and ask them how they, how they see the current situation, how they think about it, and how they talk about it. And uh, Yoli, I see you right there in the middle of my screen, so I'm gonna ask you to get started. Well, thank you, John. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you all today. And before I start, just a very big congratulations to the campaign for another content-rich GLR week with an amazing lineup of speakers all week long. So I wanna name uh, three ch challenges. You wanted us to start off with, what are the challenges that we are most concerned about. Um, and I wanna name three. I think the biggest challenge that we continue to face is this, that as a nation, we continue to refuse to address the greatest obstacle and barrier to learning, and that is poverty. I know we're gonna talk about that more a little bit later, but I, I needed to name it now as the biggest challenge in ensuring equitable access to learning. So more on that later. Related to that, a second challenge is that we also continue to refuse to acknowledge that the role of parents matters in the success of children. And not just once kids start school, but from the moment children are born, when the architecture of their brains is being built. Indeed, even with all of the science that points to the importance of those early years when the foundation for learning is established, we just simply don't equip parents with everything that they need to put that science into practice. So consequently, we fail as a society to set children up to succeed from the very beginning. So, and more on that later too. The third challenge is putting to good use the federal resources that states and schools have been given to address learning loss. As John, you shared and Sarah shared the with us via the Atlantic story. We still have thousands of disengaged students, children who need social emotional supports, families who need continued access to the hardware, to software, to broadband, and to the basic knowledge on managing technology. The issues that COVID spotlighted over the past two years have unfortunately not magically disappeared. They're still here. And many of us had hoped that our return to normal met better and different. And so the challenge is that I'm just not so sure that it's happening across the board or at scale yet. And we can't lose sight of that. So just a starting Great. point. There are others, but for me, those are the top. Great. Three. Great. Uh, Jean-Claude, let me jump to you. How do you, okay. how do you see, think about and talk about the current situation? Now, here we are nearly two and a half years since we, we first shut down schools. John, thank you again for, for being here. I think a lot of my thinking is colored by my own personal experience. So when the pandemic hit, I was at the Gates Foundation uh, working with educators, uh, housing authority leaders, community leaders in Washington, in Texas, Tennessee, New York. Um, so I got to see a lot of districts, a lot of people respond and continue to respond to, to the conditions. I also experienced it as a, as a parent. 
Um, you know, I, I have four children, one of whom was studying college, first year college student, the one was in pre-K, so I ran the entire P16 continuum. So I, I saw it from all those vantage points, So, which means for me, frankly, I think about this from an educational perspective, so the massive loss in learning, the massive disruption in education, the fact that, frankly, many of us in education got caught flat-footed, uh, and what we need to do, frankly, do not get caught that way again in the future. I also saw it from a, an economic perspective. I know the, the World Bank published that uh, if we do, if we did nothing globally, that young people stood to lose ten trillion dollars in earned income. So when you think about what is happening in higher ed, the shift perhaps in enrollment that's happening there uh, means, frankly, we've got work to do. Yes, in addressing the loss of learning in K twelve in addressing the needs of the youngest learners, frankly, like my, my pre-K at the time student child would not go on Zoom. How do we think about that in the early years grades? How we think about higher education and how we think about workforce development are the ways in which frankly, I, I spend the entire PW continuum. Great, thank you, Jean-Claude. We're gonna come back to a bunch of those questions. Uh, Susanna, um, the current situation, how do, you, how do you think about it? How do you talk about it? Yeah, no, that's, thanks for having me. It's it's really terrific to be part of this panel. Um, so I think I think a lot about the reduced academic learning and the increased social emotional needs relative that students now have relative to prior to the pandemic. And it's, those are clearly a challenge. But I think what the pandemic highlighted um, as a challenge is that, that we're not providing, well, we knew this before, but it was even clearer now that we're not providing equitable educational opportunities for students more generally. And, and one that I wanna highlight is lack of access to a caring adult who knows each student and can provide both the academic and the well-being supports that students need to survive and to thrive. Um, in some ways, it's like a difference in insurance that we have for students. Many students have times when they fall behind and need extra help, but some students have, have a support network that can step in while others don't. And I think our challenge is making sure that all students have that kind of support network that comes in when they need it, because it's really the only way that we know of to help students is to have it based on a strong relationship with an adult. So I think our challenge is more than just thinking about how do we get back to where we were before for, but more, how do we get to a place where we're providing the supports that students need, each student needs when they they um, are, are struggling in school? That's fantastic. Also, we'll come back to that, but music to my ears, of course. Uh, Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining. I'm sorry you're, you're bringing up the rear on this one, but you won't always, so go ahead. No worries. Thank you so much for inviting me and for, for being able to have some conversation with this wonderful panel. Uh, you know, I live my life in the world of early care and education. So that birth to age eight area is, is very much where I'm living. And during the pandemic, I think there were, well, there were lots of things that came up, but I think I realized that I don't see a national coherent approach to early care and education. I don't think we've decided how we care for young children, how we care for families as a country. And, and so that's been, a, that's been big. Uh, most of my time has been spent thinking about the early childhood workforce. And certainly during this pandemic, they became essential and you know we couldn't get the economy moving without them. We just don't have any respect for them, nor do we pay them any money. So you could be sort of simultaneously essential and undervalued. Uh, and, and that's been a challenge. We've lost, we've lost people from this workforce. We see huge turnover, uh, not because people don't like the field or like what they're doing, but they simply, can't feed their families. And so this notion of how we treat the people who do this, what I think is incredibly cognitively complex work is something that we haven't really come to terms with. And we can fund programs, but we always seem to sort of figure out ways in which we're not quite paying the people who work with children a living wage. Uh, when people have multiple jobs to to support their families and they're working full time, that is that is 
I think, quite problematic. Um, we'll talk about some bright, uh, what is it? Bright, bright lining, bright uh, silver linings. And I think there have been some, but I think the workforce remains a huge issue. Their preparation, their compensation, their ongoing support. And the other issue that I that I think, I'll, you only had three, I'll have three also. Uh, my third is this notion of how we link research to practice. Uh, we've got tons of research. I saw a presentation the other day where someone said it takes 17 years for research to actually get into practice. That was terrifying. <laughs> but what does that mean? How, what are the questions we're asking? Are we asking the right ones? Are we asking the right people? Do we have everybody engaged at the table to do the right thing? So those are my, those are my three. This no conceptual notion of as a country, how we deal with early care and education, the workforce and linking research to practice. Terrific. Um, before we go on towards our, our bright spots and our, our enthusiasms, I want to I want to come back to what what Yoli said about poverty. And Jacqueline, you you sort of closed us out there uh, on a similar kind of note. Uh, that I just think is extremely important. Uh, I think it was at the heart of what you said, Susanna. Like, it's no mystery that kids, every one of us ran into struggles when we were kids. There are a few magic kids who never have any problems, but I've never met any of them. Um, it's what happens when that happens and to whom that happens and what happens to those folks. So uh, Jean-Claude, let me, let me bounce back to you. And I mean, you've, you've, been, you've had so much broad experience in this space. I know that your focus is partially now on, on digital equity, but I, I would love to hear your reflections about the extent to which the challenges that we have, we're trying to, a bunch of technical, smart challenge responses to a challenge that is bigger and different, which has to do with poverty. So in fact, if you take a look at our new North Star goals of digital progress, they now talk about this idea of putting young people on the path toward economic security, agency, and well-being. And so for us, that was an acknowledgement that, that we have to broaden our definition of success to the questions and issues around poverty. For so long, we thought math and literacy proficiency were the goals. Um, but we're realizing that's a means to an end. That is a foundation. We've got to meet that. But the goals need to be so much more broader than that, right? So to me, that's the lens in which I keep thinking about this, this idea of making sure that the work that we are doing are really doing this. Otherwise, we're never going to be successful. There's so much layered beneath that around, for example, how we think of the P16 system, where we think about access to higher education, access to workforce. Uh, there's a lot there around talent management, getting the right teachers, the best teachers in, in the perhaps the most hard to staff parts. I mean, Yoli's work in LA, that was a big part of the kind of effort in making sure that you put your best teachers in the emergency room. Uh, one last thing I'll say, John, which has been perhaps a bit of my transformation the last decade or so, is that I've come to really believe in, we can talk about this later on, really believe in community aggregators, people who understand the challenges in education, but all the near sectors that, it, that impact student learning. I mean, the neuroscience work is telling us if you don't address all these things, you're never gonna get the gains you're looking for. And that means looking at, you know, child poverty, healthcare, again, what the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, by my amazing wife talks about the six dimensions of whole child. When you look at all these, you can begin to understand the work, yes, is about education, but it's also about healthcare. It's also about housing. It's also about everything else that enables a young person to be able to focus in school and do well. And John, yeah. can I just say that that I think is one of the most important learnings in the last two and a half years is that people who always thought that, you know, children weren't succeeding in school, that that was the fault of the school, the fault of the teacher. And, you know, I think hopefully we've grown to understand that learning and achievement requires a whole bunch of things. Again, starting at birth, Jacqueline and I always start there. Um, but what I see, for example, in LA is people understanding that at the table, you need housing, you need mental health, you need 
after school supports, you need transportation, you know, you, you've got to think more holistically about what children need if we're going to truly help them succeed. We cannot continue to be siloed. And I think we, not only did we learn, but we saw people in action coming together in a way that we hadn't before. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I'm going to come to you in a second, Jacqueline and, and Susanna. It makes me think of, of John A. Powell and the way he talks about um, it, it sort of this, this notion that everybody actually needs the same thing, right? Um, some people have a whole bunch of it just because of their circumstances. Other people don't. It's not different what people need. I think we've, we've typically thought, oh, people need different things because they have different circumstances. I think we're, we're going towards a, a direction in which, oh, wait, obviously all kids need essentially the same things. And it's just their access to them is, is radically different. Um, Jacqueline, you, you touched also on this notion um, of, of poverty as being part of what's going on. And I think we just want to hold this up and, and be really explicit with it. I think, you know, maybe we all do need the same thing, but poverty means that we are in different places right. needing the same thing. Right. And, and poverty really is the context in which many children and families live. And we can understand child development, we can understand what works, but if we don't understand the way poverty has an impact on, on food and shelter and, and education and, and health, it all matters. And, and so one of the things we've thought about a lot in, in our funding of research is, as we're asking research questions, what's the context in which that research is gonna be carried out? Right. How do we start to think more, not just about whether or not some one group of kids gets a higher score than another group, but why? What, yeah. what are the conditions in which they live? And so I guess the pandemic and, and just sort of life has, has led me to believe that context is everything. And yeah. if poverty is part of that context, if we're talking, and if we're honest, we're talking poverty, racism, discrimination, prejudice, all of those things, then we've got to think broader and we've got to understand not just what children need, but how they need it and, and who they are and, and come to that with a great deal of humility, I think, and, and really start to not just design good research, but to connect with those communities and, and sort of ask them, what do you need? How can we support you? How can we use research as a tool that will support the needs of communities that, that find themselves disenfranchised and, and, and disinvested in. Um, I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a mind shift. I think it's a huge mind shift for research, but I think it's gonna be necessary for really gonna meet the needs of, of kids. Yeah. Can I just jump on that for us just a quick second? I mean, what Jacqueline just said, I think he really resonates. We, we have a structure we launched last year called the Center for Inclusive Innovation. And, and what that pushes very simply is exactly what Jacqueline is describing, that when you think about research, research to practice, you center community in that, in that work. We talk about having uh, content experts and context experts sitting side by side and solving for some of the biggest challenges in education. But this idea of centering community, making sure that the questions, the research questions being asked are in context, uh, we have found to be critical. And again, we're finding more and more funders in the US DOE uh, to be getting more and more interested in that kind of construct. Yeah. Susanna, I, I, I appreciate that, uh, Jean-Claude, exactly. Um, Susanna, what you were saying about, like, all kids need help, it goes to, to again, John A. Powell's thoughts about targeted universalism. Some kids get help because they have parents who have a lot of resources and agency and all those things. Uh, and other kids are, first of all, in more complicated circumstances, they need help with whatever, and it's not as accessible. Um, how do you, as you think about, um, as you think about deploying human capital to provide support for individual young people, uh, and sometimes for their families, how do you think about um, this this barrier of poverty? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's just right. What you were saying, we looked, you know, prior to the pandemic, and there was something 
in the 40s of billions of dollars spent on tutoring uh, in the US. So there was just a lot of high income families providing supports for their kids going, going uh, on before we came into the situation that we had. And then I think it increased during the pandemic. But I mean, there's so many layers of the issue of poverty in the US. And of course we need to address family poverty. It's like unconscionable that we, we have right. so much poverty in the country that's like this. In thinking of how to address it, there is the kind of let's go after that and really focus on the reallocation of resources. And I think there should be a group of people really going after that. And then there's the thinking about how do you keep it from being multiple multi-generational? How do you keep it from being the kids of poor families are poor when they get older? And maybe there's another, there's there's a way of thinking about that given the kind of political constraints that we have on pure resource allocation right now. And I really think what everyone's been saying here is just right that that kids need all of these kinds of supports. They need the health care and the food and the housing. I don't want to get away, of course, from the fact that they also need good schools. And of because course. I think right. that is a um, it is a way that's been acceptable really to the US population to support uh, schools. It's just that we need to we need to come together and do a, do it better. And that probably takes more resources as well. But it's it's in the ballpark. And so I, I think that um, that we have to be hitting this in in multiple ways. That we're we're set in a place where we shouldn't be. It's a really non ideal situation. And then what do we do with it? Is what yeah. is kind of where we are. And I think we we all have kind of similar ideas and come at it from different points. Yola, you, you raised this issue initially, so I wanna come back to you for the last word on, on this and then we'll move forward. Um, I, I guess I'll tie a bow on this one, but maybe we'll come back to it, I don't know. Um, and it's actually one of the innovations that I was gonna share. Um, so maybe it's a good lead in to that next segment. Um, we actually have just proven to ourselves as a country that we know how to end child poverty or family poverty. Um, we actually did it in a one year period and that was with the extended child tax credit, um, which dropped poverty by 50% for children living with families. So I think that the urgency here is to not let Congress off the hook. Um, I don't intend for this to be a political conversation, but it needs to be a political conversation. <laughs> we somehow found the political will within a constrained moment in time, and then we lost it. And I think it's that we just weren't serious about ending child poverty. And I think that is going to require um, massive public push on our leaders to hold Congress accountable for ending poverty. We, we can do it. We saw that we can. We've just now reverted back when the child tax credit ended at the end of the year. And yep. Yoli, I, I can't resist. Um, the National Academies did a very interesting consensus report in 2019, Roadmap to Reducing Child Poverty, with policy packages that really indicate ways in which we can do this. So it's not as though we don't know how. We've run the models. We know what it looks like. How do we get there? Actually, Sarah, that's I would love it, Sarah, if you could enter the link to that webinar. We had Jacqueline on GL, at GLR uh, webinar on that report. It was probably one of the best because it really laid exactly what you're sharing, the models, how we get there. And this was before COVID. Yep. So, yep. you know, it actually, I think it's what it helped inform and get that piece of legislation passed for that one year. Um, but we need to, you know, we can't lose sight of that piece of work. So to, let me be slightly provocative now as we also move into talking about some of the bright spots and the, the responses that we saw, which is I 100% subscribe to what you just said, Yoli, about the importance of the child tax credit, tried to do work on it, so forth. Shocking that it didn't, it didn't stick. Right. But there's something to learn from that. We, we all saw the articles, childhood poverty dropped by 50 percent, but apparently nothing happened that was profound enough 
for people to rise up and say, oh, we have to have this. Like the observable, feelable difference for not only those who are recipients, but that this made for a better society, a society that works. Somehow, now look, it was a short period of time and that was possibly dumb, but um, people didn't experience that. And so they didn't demand that it stuck. We're talking here about a lot of really smart ideas from early childhood to digital equity, to high quality tutoring, to parent engagement. And we know that there are a bunch of resources out there right now to pursue these ideas. But my, my thing, my current obsession is if people don't experience that things get a lot better for them, for their kids, and for their communities, these ideas won't stick. The money will run out. Nobody will. Nobody will. You know, demand. Oh no, we can't not have that anymore, because this is what it's going to take. I think so. This is why I'm. I'm so stuck on this notion of executing with excellence, so that people experience something that is to them observably different and they want to continue to have that. Um, so with that, let's let's talk about some of what some of the actual progress we saw, the innovation, the ideas, and the possibilities that we saw during the course of the pandemic. Jacqueline, I'm going to come to you um, first. You know, in the in the world of early childhood um, care and learning, what did you see and what are you you now pursuing as things that unfolded during the pandemic that hold great promise going forward? You know, when the pandemic began and the workforce was pretty much decimated, I mean, people were just shocked. You know? yeah. And they started thinking about what do people get paid? And then they were shocked again because they're getting paid minimum wages. So we've known that for 40 years. And I think that notion of the economy coming back, but not the people who care for and educate young children was an incredible impetus for states and municipalities to suddenly think we, we need to do something. And I say suddenly, but, and it, but it's not really suddenly. So if you take the District of Columbia that you know has now childcare staff who are gonna receive some supplemental payments and their recommendations that assistant teachers getting $10,000 more, lead teachers 14, and, and then ways in which they'll fund programs directly. So they'll have some sustainable way of raising, of raising salaries. That's great. It, it also took the long, it's the long game that they've played. So this is years and years of work to get to a point where it was suddenly important. So it's that, you know, um, opportunity and preparation yeah, meeting, right, and, right. and there you are. So, and you think of the state of Virginia, that's, that's as we had in the other webinar, that's looking at how do you figure out how you decrease the turnover in staff in, in childcare centers? And so they're playing with models that, that look at how much money do you give people to really, just to start to stabilize the workforce because turnover is a disaster. So there's a lot of that going on. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly heartened by a group of funders who have gotten together and their perspective is, in addition to lots of other things, there's a whole narrative change that needs to be made around the early care and education workforce. Mm -hmm. There are these mental models that say anybody can do this work. Uh, what is it doesn't really matter. It's it's probably the family's responsibility anyway. Why would government get involved and a shift around that? And so they've um, they've put their resources together and they're they're hiring folks who have a lot of experience uh, some of them you know John, yep, uh, yep. to really to really start to think about a national campaign to shift that narrative around who these people are that this is a complex task um, as we think sure. about this connection to research for, of research and practice i see a lot more conversation around research practice partnerships uh, NICHD actually had a wonderful meeting around research practice partnerships. And that is the shift that Jean-Claude was talking about. It's not just 
we'll connect some researchers to some policy people. No, it is giving the communities, giving the, the, the practitioners agency and voice in what kind of research is going to be done. Uh, we have a new project at the foundation with it that's an indigenous RPP. So we met with, with tribal leaders and it took us pretty much a year to really start to gain trust, to build trust, to think about what all this could mean and how they could feel comfortable understanding that we were not using them as guinea pigs, that we needed to learn and that they had agency in how this work was done. So I see that kind of of, of recognition of a huge need and there are spots. And so if you look at, I think um, the Center for the Study of Childcare Employment has wonderful tracking of where states are going with the early childhood workforce as does the National League of Cities. And I think that's a really important place to keep, those are important places to keep looking to see what, what needs to be done and what is being done. That's fantastic. I, I want to put a pin in what you said about the workforce, because I think when we think about barriers, we have all these great ideas, but one of the great challenges we're seeing across both education and youth development systems right now are challenges related to, to the workforce. And maybe you've learned some things, you know, you're ahead in the early childhood space uh, because of the work that you did during the um, during the pandemic. So uh, maybe you have lessons to tell everybody else as they struggle with workforce issues. And no pressure, um, right? No pressure, no pressure. Susanna, let's let's come to you. And, and you know, what what progress did you see during the pandemic that is is leading you to some some optimism about what could happen going forward? Yeah, I, I've been seeing lots and lots of innovation. I, I want to just step back for one second and respond to what you said, and then I'll tell you the, some of the bright spots. But right. what I think what you emphasize is how important it is to execute with excellence. And I think that's right. But having something really work and then having it be sustained and be uh, scaled, it's not, it's not something that happens automatically. You need to understand the implementation of it and how to support it, make it really easy to implement. You have to get the word out that this is really uh, a really effective because even it's just hard for us to see as a parent, it's hard for me to see what's working and what isn't working in school. So we have to be really strategic and clear about scaling promising practices so that we can really do that well. I, and so on, on that point, I mean, it really, for me, I'm pointing down here because Jacqueline's down here on my screen. Um, it really connects to, for me, to Jacqueline's point about narrative. Like people need to experience a difference, but then they need to hear it so they can make sense of it and bring it all together. And sometimes we think, oh, if we just do it wonderfully, um, then it'll all be great. And sometimes we think if we just tell a great story, they won't even pay attention to the fact that it's actually kind of mediocre. We have to do both. And probably you have to do more things than just that. There's probably yeah. political pressure and other things involved. But, um, but I don't think any of it really works in a great way without excellence. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think you do need excellence, but you do you need these other things too. You need to get the word out through narratives, yep. through people who influence, who, you know, I'm going to make a decision to do this because of somebody that I know who's, who's uh, providing that information to me. And then it has to be doable. Their schools anyway have so many millions of things going on right now. Teachers are overwhelmed. Administrators are overwhelmed. The district leaders, school leaders are overwhelmed. Yeah. So you need to make it as easy as possible to, to do this. But that Agreed. said, I think that we've all been struck by the kind of an enormity of the need that is out there and that there is a lot of there are many, many inspired people out there trying to do the very best they can for students. And this is in schools, but it's also in communities. It's in universities, which I'm very happy about since that's where I sit. But I think, there, for example, I think on the workforce, there's lots of universities can do to really help with that in the long run if we can think more strategically about pipelines. One example, because I've been working on tutoring, is that teacher preparation programs across the country have an opportunity to both improve the teacher preparation that they're providing by having their uh, 
teacher candidates tutor, and at the same time providing those resources to schools. So there are lots of ways that we can really think about scaling some of these practices. And then if I look out there, I, I see that many places are doing it. So we've been working with a whole bunch of school districts around the, the country, rural, urban, uh, west, east, south, north, uh, you know, small and large. And so many of them are really trying new things. They're, they're thinking about how can, uh, as you probably all know, they really focused a lot on the summer and what they could do in the summer. They focused a lot on tutoring and what they can do to provide these resources to, to students. Uh, if you look, there's an organization called Reading Corps, for example, that's serving 35, they serve 35,000 district uh, students in, partnerships with districts in 12 states just last school year. Denver and Guilford are doing their own programs. There's, there's lots of belief out there that you could really help students and many of the districts are really trying. So I do think there are those silver linings, but that you need this kind of, just like we were talking about, these kinds of supports, both getting the word out, but also helping to make it easier in this kind of chaotic time to, to um, support the, the students and the children. John claude I'm going to come to you about digital access, but also uh, I invite you to fan out to your other experience from, from running districts to being a funder and how you think about um, what's happening now and what can happen going forward. John, so much of what's been said really resonates. So when we think about, for example, digital access, we think about it as a means to an end. So why is that important? So let me, let me take, take a step back in a second to think about, talk about what I've been witnesses in, in, in watching in education. So I often lean on Rebecca Winthrop's work at Brookings Institution, where she talks about this idea of leapfrogging inequality. So we look for these kinds of innovations that are addressing really, again, long-standing challenges in education in ways of really leapfrogging what's been, what's been happening. So, I mean, there's so much has happened over the last two plus years in terms of connected learning, in terms of, for quickly digital access, there's, there's a downside to that too, meaning that, for example, we've gone to nearly 86% of kids getting access to devices or broadband. Often the broadband is insufficient or devices are not really powerful enough for powerful learning. So there's a lot of issues around closing that gap in the way that it's sustained over time. We've seen some amazing innovations taking hold around the student record, the learning, the learner employment record, which shifts agency to the student versus the institution. Imagine having a student record that carries with you for life, where your work record, your employment record is yours, which gets into Jacqueline the issues around credentialing that can support early learning workers. We're doing some work right now in Dallas in looking at the educator pathway, not just teachers and principals, but starting with the, uh, the childcare centers and seeing how do we think about innovation and talent there and moving that all the way up to the, the, the school leader, for example. So it's one educated pathway that provides a kind of uh, credentialing pieces that really are critical and important. There's a lot there around digital transformation in education that can begin to help us really understand how we leapfrog. The connections between the social, the emotional, the cognitive. We used to think academic was this big, cognitive was this big. Now we know cognitive is must be this big. Academic is the other way around. But the, anyway, the <laughs> early childhood workers and the, the special educators have known this for a long time, how important these things are. Now in general education, we're beginning to really understand how we learn that. I talked about the six dimensions of the whole child, right? So academic, cognitive, physical, mental health. Now we understand what that means in terms of really doing the work to support young people ton of efforts around the neurosciences, but sort of pulling back a bit to perhaps some of the more global challenges, which we think could be could be had. The 65 billion that the, that the, that the Biden administration is being pushed into states could be a way of closing the digital gap once and for all, uh, but it's gotta be done smartly. I think it's part of the challenge. And the digital learning gap, we talk about very often a digital promise, which is technology to what end? Um, and how do you really lay on the teaching and learning process, you know, that is really critical and important. But if we're just, just like really going about more macro lens, come back to this idea of putting people on the path toward economic security, you have to think about how the workforce needs to respond to this, how you connect education to employment to make sure again that people are on that path toward that kind of um, 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 piece. But you know, one of the lines I hear often during the pandemic is that the pandemic has laid bare. It seems to be how everything starts, every report you read. Uh, but the question of what does that mean exactly and what do we do about it? It comes back to this conversation of connecting different sectors 
together to really support and and and, and the, the, the whole individual, the families, in, in, in making sure making happen what happens. So the, I've seen some things, for example, in in Washington State in the Seattle area, where African refugees begin to shift curricula in school systems, demanding that the history of you, you name the country that's uh, supplying folks here, the U.S. That, that shows up in the history curriculum. I saw success happening because parents had a view, a visibility into the pedagogy, the curriculum they never had before, and are beginning to demand change. But bottom line, which is again, what needs to happen here is the inertia has to continue. And the question is, how do you get the kind of advocacy to make sure that the stories are being told, that people understand, yes, that we went down by 50%, but it needs to be maintained by the poverty, closing the poverty gap, poverty levels in the US. What I often find is that we tend to live in echo chambers. We talk to each other, but we don't make sure that we are pushing the right kinds of stories out of all of this and shaming the politicians to make sure they do the right thing uh, and giving them the solutions as well too. But more importantly, I've seen amazing efforts in pushing politicians, shaming them into the right thing to support uh, communities. Last thing I'll say, John, very quickly is that I've seen these aggregators, like the Commit Partnership in Dallas, when they stand together and do things, it gets done because they know how to manage Austin and they know how to manage Dallas ISD uh, to make sure the true line actually exists. But you need a kind of independent third party organizations who have those tentacles everywhere who can push both on the practice and the policy construct to support what is hap what's happening in communities. That's fantastic. I want to come back to that. Uh, Jean-Claude, in just a second to talk about what, what communities can do, because a lot of the people who are listening today are leading community efforts or leading state efforts. Uh, but Yoli, let me, let me come to you. I think it's, it's possible, arguably, that, that the thing that we saw most clearly in the pandemic uh, was the role that parents play in supporting their young people's, their kids' learning and development. And um, I think it gave us a window into some possibilities that have uh, a potential great unlock for the parents and for the kids. So I, I'd, I'd love to hear what, what you guys saw and what you think it means. Yeah, I mean, if there was ever a silver lining, that was it. And that was the appreciation that, you know, sort of emerged given what was happening with children having to learn at home with parents needing to be involved, but the appreciation of teachers for families, for parents, but also the appreciation of parents for teachers and how, just how, what it takes to teach. Um, I, I think it created a very new reality that I hope we are building on that, that the relationship between parents and teachers um, is so critical and that we we now can see how we can manage that better. Um, I wanna share just very briefly on that point, um, the work that we saw emerging um, because of the appreciation between parents and teachers is an organization called Parent Teacher Home Visits. I happen to be on their board, so I know about their work. <laughs> um, but you know, they've been working with districts to promote parent teacher home visits. Um, and they shared and have looked at all of the ways in which schools that did do had had um, had a better, more immediate ability to connect with families when school shut down were those that had established those parent teacher home visits because there had been a relationship, there had been trust that had been built. And we now see there's a number of school districts that I could point to, um, districts that are building off of that because they do, they are beginning to see and hopefully will stay focused on that, that parents can no longer be on the outside. Right. That parent, that this idea of parent engagement is really about parent relationship and about parent trust and about parent space and about sharing parent power. Um, and that when you do that, when you honor that, kids actually do better. Um, I see that the videos. You want to you wanna, you wanna go ahead and show these videos a second, Yoli, because uh, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to bridge this conversation into. Um, we're, I think we're all persuaded and we're all in heated agreement, and we have an aud an audience today of state and community leaders, uh, and I really want to ask each of you 
what state and community leaders who are already persuaded um, the, of the importance of all of what we're talking about today, what they need to be doing right now. So uh, go ahead, Yoli. Let me set the context for what you, the folks are seeing on the screen right now. We're gonna show you three very, very, very short videos. Or very like short. 15 second videos, but my hope, our hope at the TMW Center is that leaders across this nation, and I mean all leaders that have any relationship to the well-being and success of children, that all leaders begin to understand that for children to succeed, their parents need to succeed. But more than understand, leaders need to act. As Dr. Dana Suskin points out in her new book, Parent Nation, we have the scientific argument, the economic argument, the moral argument. What we need is public and political will to push for a society that truly puts children and fa families at the center, which is why we've launched the Building a Parent Nation campaign. And it gets to your point, John, about why aren't we demanding more? Why have it, we, went, we were talking about the child tax credit at the time, um, but it's because we have not created the spaces to, to bring parents and caregivers and allies together in a way to demand better for them, but for their children. So I wanna share with you the message that we're building into this campaign and what we hope leaders across the country will amplify, but then do something about. And they're the messages that tell us why the role of parents matters so much on all kinds of levels. So let's go through these three quick videos and I think you'll get the message. Did you understand it though? Yeah. No. What our nation has? Lots of devoted parents. What our nation needs? Better ways to support them. Like paid leave for the early days that go too fast. The potential of children depends on support for their parents. It takes a nation, a parent nation. Oh my God, they're adorable. <laughs> so brave. They are, aren't they? I'm learning how to spell and I think I do it well. What our nation has? Lots of devoted parents. What our nation needs? Better ways to support them. Like flexible work schedules for moments you can't redo. The potential of children depends on support for their parents. It takes a nation, a parent nation. Do you like your new room? Yeah! What our nation has? Lots of devoted parents. What our nation needs? Better ways to support them. Like affordable housing, for the security kids need. <laughs> the potential of children depends on support for their parents. It takes a nation, a parent nation. Thank you for letting me show those. And I'll put in the chat more about the campaign, about the parent villages we're building to create the demand that we were talking about earlier. Great, great, great. Jacqueline, uh, I want to come to you. Um, question on the table is, okay, we all agree. Uh, and some of us are sitting in places on this Zoom call and other people are sitting in communities and thinking about what they can do to drive um, for more equitable learning opportunities for kids in their communities. And so talk about what at a community level, folks can be doing on the early care and learning for kids. So I'm going to frame this in, in the way we've thought about it at the foundation as a kind of dual pronged approach. Uh, we are very much focused on supporting policymakers to lift up these issues around the early care and education workforce. And that's the sort of governors and state legislators and all that but we're also looking at grassroots organizing. 
I, I just want to remind you that nothing moved the field so quickly as realizing that these essential people were not there. Uh, there was a realization that I don't have a place to send my child, and that I think got some things moving. So at that level, I think I, I, the word agency keeps coming to my mind. Mm -hmm. This notion of people understanding that they have agency, that they have that they have the ability to make some change, to think for themselves, to speak for themselves, and I think that we have taken that away in many cases from children from parents, from, from communities. And so we have a group of people who make decisions, you know, sort of organizations. But if you're at the community level, that realization that you have power, that you can make your wishes known, who's speaking for me? And I think that's an important question for folks. Who, is, who has my back, if you will? Who is putting out there the notions that I have? And so when we do... When we do webinars, we'll, you know, it's wonderful to have lovely organizations that have worked for 50 years on, on these issues, but you need somebody who understands the field. So I would say to those folks who are sort of in the trenches and doing their work, look to see what's going on in your community. What are the real needs? Who are the people who are supposed to be speaking for you? Are they really? Are they promoting the kinds of and so if it's, if it's a principal, then you ask your superintendent and the state, what are you doing? If you're a community-based organization, are the folks who are supposed to be representing you actually speaking for, for you and representing what you really want? I think, I think it's important to also keep yourselves educated. There's a lot of momentum right now and a lot of places. I, I mentioned the Center for, for um, the Study of, of Child Care, of child care employment. Uh, they have a great website and they have lots of things to tell you what communities are doing. There is uh, the National League of Cities, lots of places where mayors have been really looking, working with communities. They have a website that can help you understand what it is that those folks are doing. So keeping educated about what's going on, but also realizing, and I think we've been kind of dancing around this, that implementation is really hard. And implementation isn't just modeling exactly what some other place did. It's trying to figure out how some successful yes. program could possibly fit your needs. What are the elements of that program that would work for you? What are the elements that you can adopt? And how do you, how do you start to talk about that and look at its, its, how it's going over time? I hope that answered some of your yeah, questions. Yes, definitely, definitely. Jean-Claude. We now have a bunch of money on the table around digital access. We have a lot of people on this call who want to help drive that issue in their communities. What's, what's your advice to them? What can state and community leaders do right now uh, to help drive forward the digital access uh, and equitable digital access issues that you've been, you've been leading on? John, we'll, we'll get to the existing dollars, but the 65 billion coming to states, I believe um, the state officials have to propose a draft of a plan or planning grant, I guess sometime in the fall. So the time is now to, to reach out to those folks, the chief state school officer, the governor's offices, et cetera, and how are you planning on doling out those dollars to the localities to make sure that, again, this is being done smartly. Uh, we are in the process of writing a white paper that's going to be gone to the NGA and other places say, look, this is what we've learned in a decade of doing this work that you guys ought to emulate because this is about closing the gap once and for all. So this new money is coming from the feds, but again, to your points, the execution at the state level and the localities is going to be really, really important. What, the other what thing, do you, Jean-Claude, what issues specifically should our community leaders be keeping their eyes on and pressing their leaders on in order that this happens just the way you want it to? You know, so two things. One is that we saw a lot of one-time spending during the pandemic in buying devices and access to broadband without really necessarily thinking about the long-term sustainability of the effort. 
for example, you, we all know you buy a laptop or you buy a Chromebook in, in a year, two years, it's obsolete. So making sure that there's a refresh rate and plan in place is important. The second thing around broadband access, having a device without full access to the internet to broadband is almost meaningless. Um, so making sure that the broadband is sufficient. When you look at it, there's an amazing report from New America that came out a year ago um, that really talks about this idea of sufficient access to the internet that so many families have gotten access to broadband, but then goes dark in the middle of the day because the data plan is insufficient. But all these are critically important. So I, watching and making sure that these elected officials and all these appointed officials, like the state chief, are putting plans in place uh, to make those things happen really well. And that can be done through the school system, right? That yep. through, this, through the Board of Education superintendent to push up to the governor's office, say, this is what we need in making those things happen. But the most important thing around this is not the technology, but the technology to what end. When you think about all the educational issues that need to be addressed, you know, how are you thinking about technology being leveraged to further the academic and non-academic development of young people, right? So, so it's not just a device, but making sure the teacher development is there, making sure the academic plans are in place that leverages technology and not just another toy that put, that's put in the classroom. We call that right. the digital learning gap. So all that can be done through the school districts to push up to the state level to making sure those plans are actually well in place. One last thing, John, on all this is that there's been existing dollars. I mean, the FCC, many people don't know, uh, fund this kind of effort every single year. So when Verizon, T-Mobile, and everything else get access, get access to the space, um, there's also money being pulled to support state efforts around digital uh, access. So before the pandemic, this has been there. So making sure that those dollars too are being spent in a way that's really smart in supporting the effort. Again, that could be all the way to workforce development is being done smartly. One last example, uh, and this is perhaps germane to New York State, but New York has this thing called the New York State textbook law that requires districts to buy textbooks. Look, most publishing companies have now rebranded themselves as ed tech companies. Digital first is how they talk about this. Yeah, these archaic laws still exist. So those can be changed as well. These are millions of dollars every single year that goes to school district where the folks' hands are tied to actually buy uh, antiquated uh, 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 books. So there are existing laws, existing funding from the FCC and new dollars coming, coming into the states that can really be leveraged to do wonderful things for districts if again, the message and the plan is done well, and I would push on the masses, you can do this through your district, you can do it directly with the governor's office or the state chief, make sure that your voices are heard so that the plans when they go out sometime in the fall, I believe they do sometime in the end of September, that those plans are cogent and really addresses the long-term needs of digital access for, for young people. Jean-Claude, do, do you have a, um, a, a resource, a workbook, uh, for communities about what they should be asking for? And if so, will you post it in the chat? Yeah, um, I'll put some things in the chat. We're actually developing a resource guide now. We just met again this morning and make sure this goes out to governors and state chiefs before the plans were actually due to make sure they understand what we've learned in, in a decade of this, this, kind, um, this kind of effort. There's a lot right. of work being done by a few of us um, right. to make sure that people have access. Great. I think that people in our network would love to be equipped with um, with some key points and some places to bring those key points around making this a success. So Suzanne, well, yeah, before go you go, just quick before going, I was talking to a, a gentleman I met in London a few weeks ago. He's in Uruguay. Do you know during the pandemic, they went from 25% of classrooms having technology to 100%. They closed the gap in Uruguay. If Uruguay can do it, I think America can do it too. <laughs> Outstanding. Susanna, um, again, the, this question about what leaders in communities can do. If we see that um, the, the critical importance of caring adults and the power of um, the relationship brought through a tutor, tutoring platform to accelerate learning and young person's feeling of belonging and agency. Um, what is it that community leaders ought to be thinking about and pressing for right now? Yeah, so I think community leaders, they have so much power and we, it's just that they have to be able to leverage it. Like the ARP funding decisions require community input. There are just lots of places that would take community input if it, if it came in. Now the trick I think, and um, 
Jean-Claude, you were talking about this as well. You spent a lot of time putting information together to make it easier for community leaders to, to think about what they want and choose it and advocate for it. And I think we need a lot of materials there so that community the community leaders can really think about what's right for their community, but at the same time, knowing some options that are available. So I think there's work to be done separate from community leaders that, that could really provide some supports. But I think, I mean, I think in our specific example of high impact tutoring, I'd love it if community uh, leaders would learn more about the uh, potential for high impact tutoring and the design, what it makes, the, the worst thing is to do it badly. What you really need to be thinking in your mind is, are my students getting access to, a, to an adult who really cares about me, really understands what I need, and can give me the supports that I need, whether it's social, emotional, or academic? You've got to keep that in the back of your mind, because otherwise you can think about tutoring and it can take you anywhere. So it's really important to think about what kind of uh, characteristics. For example, it needs to be a consistent tutor, and you need to meet with them a good amount of time and things like that. The second is to demand continual updates from the local programs, from the tutoring programs, to get a sense of about whether they're um, being implemented effectively. So I think, I think community programs outside of schools can do some really good high impact tutoring, but one of the worries there is that students don't show up and particularly some of the students most in need uh, don't show up. So make sure that that's not happening, you know, keep, keep monitoring that and then be willing to share what you've learned with other communities. I think again, when we've been talking about this, we've, we've thought about how important stories are and how important a trusted source is community members can really be and community leaders can be trusted sources to other community leaders. And so I think if they if they um, choose a good program, if they um, monitor it well, and then if they're willing to share, those are all really important things that community leaders can do. And we actually have some resources and stuff that can be helpful with this, but, it, but a, a lot of the work falls onto community leaders. I, I hope you will share those resources, Susanna. Uh, I know you have before. Uh, Yoli, uh, I want to come to you quickly on the community engagement because there's a way in which um, parent engagement is at its essence community engagement. But how do how do we um, create enough community uh, drive and will to demand that parents uh, be involved at every level, whether it's um, you know in, in partnership with teachers or engaging with uh, with educational leaders? I think it takes real intentionality at the district level. I mean, it's no surprise that it's the school system that has most of the power um, and that they keep holding that power. So it really is behooving the system itself to um, give some of that up and, and to create the spaces uh, for that kind of parent I, I, I struggle with the word parent engagement because it feels yeah. like we're minimizing really what we're talking about here. Um, but schools have to create the space. They have to create the opportunity. They have to uh, think differently about their relationship with parents. And, you know, I always lift up Dr. Karen Mapp's work at Harvard, yep. the dual capacity framework. Um, if, if schools are intent on closing gaps. That's always the first place that I go to because we have 50 years of evidence that schools that truly partner with parents are, are the schools where they have gotten the closest to closing gaps. Nobody's closing all the gaps, unfortunately, but those that have really done the work around really embracing parents as equal partners in the education of their children, are the schools that are gonna move the fastest. And that's at all levels. You know, it's it's about not only what happens at home with your child, but what happens at school, what happens with technology, what happens with reading. Um, I appreciate, there's a couple of comments in the chat in the chat about the science of reading. I hope we get to that question. Um, but parents are integral in that. It, it, it's not just about the parent and it's not just about the teacher and it's not just about the school. It's about all three working together. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally subscribe to what you're saying. And I would also say that in the history of humankind, people don't love to give up power 
other people have to take it. And I think it goes back to something that Jacqueline said earlier. We have to find the ways to encourage and make space for people to take back some of that power because power structures and people who have power just don't love to give it up. Well, uh, and, and this is the point of the parent villages and the movement we're building is to help build that agency, the capacity, the confidence of, bar- of parents to really step up in their own power to demand it. So thank you for yep. raising that. You're absolutely right. Uh, Sarah, do you want to um, pop onto the screen and uh, put forward a question or two from the audience? I have one big question I want to ask, but I want to make sure that we get uh, an opportunity to ask uh, some of the questions that have been put in the Q&A box. Sure. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll ask a question that uh, Yoli was kind of referring to in terms of some of the conversation in the chat and also in the Q&A box about the science of reading. Um, Laura Lay is saying it feels like that the science of reading should be a bigger part of today's conversation. Um, what if we all saw, or what if we solve all the other problems and students are still not able to read well and they aren't reading because they are receiving ineffective instruction? This is an easier fix than some of the other discussed societal issues, she says. Any thoughts mm-hmm. about that, making sure that um, our educators in our classrooms are truly trained in the science of reading so that they can deliver uh, reading instruction through that. Susanna, you want to you start and then uh, I'll come to you, Jean-Claude? That's a good question. Um, Yes, it's been kind of amazing, right, that we haven't made more progress at getting the science of reading into classrooms as um, given research that's out there. And I think that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, which is you can't just do research and expect it to have any influence. You have to really think about what it means for people's decisions. Where are the decision points and how can we help the, the folks who have so much control over what happens to make those good decisions. I think things like Ed reports have probably helped in some of this in terms of getting this out. So there's a source of information, a trusted source of information that people can go to. In my specific case of high impact tutoring, I think it's actually, here's a new source of supports for reading. It's a lot of it is in early elementary school reading that, that high impact tutoring is happening because learning to read is so important. And there, because they're kind of new programs, because they're um, uh, most of them are using research to support the importance of their work and and get um, districts to use them. The science of the science of reading is is part of what they're doing. So I do think that the tutoring approach is going to help at least get most students. Uh, who receive tutoring access to uh, materials that align with with this? Jean Claude, you know, thoughts on science of reading? Of course, I put a couple of links in the chat. You know, we we're known in so many places as a digital uh, organization, but what people don't know is that a third of our organizations are PhDs, learning scientists who do a lot of research to practice work. We work with 300 school districts, 60,000 teachers. And now we just acquired a global organization that we will push our work to about 40, 50 countries around the world. The fact is everything we do is research to practice. So our learning scientists, we have experts in early learning, experts in K-12 in higher ed for designing courses, writing reports, really, really leans on this idea of training school leaders and teachers on the best way to teach reading. Um, and that is a big part of our work. We do perhaps a bit more in terms of what we call computational thinking, is how do you embed those kinds of critical thinking skills in math, in science, in social studies, in reading as well. It's all part of what we do as as an organization. The best thing is I put the link around our reports uh, here. You can mine, but just know that we tend to fend this out to the entire public. We have all kinds of webinars, both we do with uh, GLR and others. Uh, and frankly, we do a lot of work with school districts across the US, again, 300 of them in all uh, are part of our efforts. Great, thanks. So I think actually the, the question about science and of reading gets to, to the, in the direction of the big question I wanna ask. And um, Sierra, if you wanna put up the poll, any time is fine. And, um, we really encourage people to fill out the poll. It helps us um, with content and um, improving our practice, which we want to do. So thank you. Thank you for that, Sierra. And thank you to folks for, for filling it out. 
I think the, the question about science of reading uh, gets to this issue of, you know, we could do all these things that everybody's talking about, like we could have better early childhood care and learning, and we could have better digital access, we could have more parents involved in partnership with schools, and we could provide high quality tutoring. Um, but none of those, it, it, they all sort of feel like oh, here's another single shot solution that if we just do this thing really well, it's all going to be great, which each one of us knows is not right. All these things live in a much larger ecosystem. So sometimes we talk about collaboration, which sounds like somehow, you know, random acts of kindness working together. That doesn't seem like a really, uh, a whole child, you know, how can we mirror our own rhetoric about a whole child belief in the way that we behave with respect to other innovations that are important. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how, you know, Jean-Claude, you think about digital access right now, you have all these learning scientists also, but how are you thinking about early childhood and how are you thinking about parents and what do you think about tutoring? And, but I don't mean to jump on you, Jean-Claude, it's like everybody, how do you think about the other parts and, yeah. and how do we bring this together in a more holistic and effective way? Because as everybody says, partnership, collaboration, these are unnatural acts and they're hard and the funding environment doesn't exactly work that way. Either the public or the private funding environment doesn't exactly work that way. So I'm really curious for, you talked about these integrators or aggregators, Jean-Claude, and I think the people who are listening today are those kind of people. They're trying to pull together all these ideas and push them forward, putting the kids at the center of their efforts. Um, I'm curious among all of you, how you think about not just advancing single shot solutions, but a really much more integrated approach to uh, supporting young people, especially those young people who are growing up in challenging circumstances. So I'll quickly, I'll quickly start. That was a big part of my effort when I was at the Gates Foundation. We went in looking for how communities are moving kids from pre-K through post-secondary. What we discovered was collective effort. Uh, in, in, in the process. So I've talked about the commit partnership. There's the RGV focus, Rio Grande Valley focus, the CS for education, where these folks look at the education data. They see the attrition of young people across the system. Yes, they understand learning variability, they understand learning sciences, but they say, unless we wrap our hands around these kids and begin to solve for the so fundamental challenges that they're facing seven days a week, 24 hours a day, we're never going to get the success. So they've been able to create a kind of sort of cross braiding of funding structures uh, to make things happen. Again, the community partnership, they'll have a collective idea. When the pandemic, give you a concrete example. When the pandemic hit, they mapped the county, knew exactly where the gaps were in digital access. Then they begin to push for funding actually make it happen. Uh, before that, they, they have a construct now called the economic mobility system they build to get all around economic mobility but they are looking at data in high school to post-secondary access, post-secondary to workforce, where the gaps are, where the solutions are. And again, finding the funding, both in terms of the government, local foundations to make it happen to demonstrate, be sure that Dallas can be an exemplar in the country. So I find these aggregators to be the ones often who can bring these kinds of different disparate sectors together. Thanks. Jacqueline, I think that sometimes uh, early childhood is is carved off from some of these things. It's sort of a time early time time limited, and people think, oh, if you just get it right, then everything else is going to be easy peasy and smooth for the rest of forever. So, how do you connect early childhood uh, care and learning opportunities to all of these other ideas? I think it's important to take a big picture perspective and to ask, what are we trying to do? What is our purpose across this Hollywood Squares group? I mean, I think we're trying to produce individuals who are thoughtful and curious and, and so all true. those things. They're, they're intelligent, they can, they, they can lead a country. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to, to shape human beings. And so we all have pieces of it, but it is a complex and dynamic system. So if we 
ever think that our one piece is the only piece, then we are doomed to failure. So when I look at early childhood, I see that as a really critical period of development, but it's setting the stage. And so there better be some really good K-3 work going on and some good, and some good middle school and high school and good colleges. So I, I, it has to all be connected. You choose where you wish to sit and where you wish to exercise your energy, but you have to see the whole picture so that if I look at early childhood, I'm thinking there are parents and teachers and communities We've got early learning standards and health promotion. We've got a ton of things that have to happen. My spot may be the workforce at this moment, but that doesn't mean that I don't have to keep my eye out as see where is it that I can make more connections? Where is it that we can think about how this ladder will go? So I think that for, for us thinking about how you even develop teachers and help prepare them means that they have to have this big picture. And so if you prepare teachers who see their role as partnering with parents, who see their role as partnering with other professionals, who see themselves as committed to the communities in which their, cho their children live and grow, you, you, you have to take a bigger picture. Uh, I think that the tragedy in our work is that we are siloed in ways that are just detrimental to children. Somebody asked a question about, you know, what happens if we do all of this and children still don't read? I think if we do all of this right, they will flourish, they will thrive, they will be just fine because we want the kinds of, of parents and teachers who are focused on that. Academic achievement is not secondary to anything. It's, it's, it is one package. So, so I see myself working at the early stages of development, but I know that life has to go on and there better be, <laughs> there better be a good place. So I'm perfectly willing to, uh, to pay property taxes in New Jersey to support good school systems, the <laughs> highest property taxes in the country. But I, I, I do mean that. I think it is, yep. I think we look at little pieces. We don't look at this, at the complexity of it. And the complexity is not a bad thing. It's the right. reality. Yep. And, and I think we have to face that. So Susanna, I don't think you could find in the whole country a more ardent enthusiast than I for high dosage tutoring, relationship-based learning. And I, I confess that I could, I could be a person who would say, well, look, everything else can go wrong. And then here comes the, the, the great tutor who's well-prepared and boom, magically everything gets better. That's a fantasy, obviously. So I'm curious, but, but I think tutoring has that sort of, oh, here's the single shot, you know, perfect silver bullet that's going to that's gonna solve everything. So I'm curious how you think about working with other parts of youth development and, um, and schooling and the supports around kids um, so that you don't become a, sort of that magic silver bullet, which is false. Yeah, that's right. I mean, lots of things in schools matter a lot. What's funny for me being on this call is that I have kind of these weird areas of focus in my research, which is the early childhood workforce, the supports for parents, and then I've done some stuff on digital uh, learning. So I feel like this group just fits very nicely with the kind of research that I do. But I, I think there was an opportunity uh, with the pandemic to really think about what students who had gone through, um, had disconnected from school, had lost some different kinds, what did they really need? And this was, and then there's a lot of funds that come with it as well. So this was really a great time to think like, what can we do with this that can be really transformational in, transformational in the long run? And so I think it was a really good time for that, but that doesn't mean it, that having, high impact tutoring work relies on having a school system that works, relies on having good things going on in the classroom and a curriculum to link to and a data system that provides the tutor with information about what the student needs. There are lots of things that, that are needed there. So unfortunately, education is a super complex long-term undertaking and no one thing is gonna matter. But I do think there's things that we can share, like the importance of a, a close, 
an adult who knows you well, that, 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 can, that can kind of follow us through lots of things. The other, the other learning that I've had recently is that there's lots of people out there that see, see programs that are available to everyone and that are opt-in, that that means equal access. And it really doesn't because the people, the, the, the folks who take it up are gonna be, at least for students, they're gonna be the ones who are already engaged, who know how to, to um, you know, use the system for their benefits and others who really need it won't. So there's a learning that applies not just to, to what I'm working on right now, but to all these other situations as well. Just giving information broadly to all communities is not going to help you need to know who you, whom you're talking with. And so I think that we can work well together because we understand the, the importance of what each of us does, but we can also learn a lot from each other because what we're experiencing in one place applies in many, many cases to the other places as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Wow, what a tremendous um, the group of, of friends and advocates and, and teachers for all of us. Um, hugely appreciate each of you joining us for this special GLR Week session. Uh, and uh, thank everybody who, who joined us today. Um, wonderful. Thank our ASL interpreters and Sarah and Sierra. Uh, for doing a terrific job in putting this all together. Um, just a huge appreciation. Sarah, I think I will turn it back to you. And then we have one more marvelous video that we want to share with the crew. But Susanna, Yoli, Jean-Claude, Jacqueline, thank you all so, so much for joining us today and for all that you do for the space and, and for, for kids. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you all so much. This has been such an amazing conversation. I hope you're able to see all of the uh, kudos that you are all receiving in the chat box. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thank you to all of you who joined and listened in and engaged in the chat box in this conversation today. I hope you'll continue to join us for more GLR Week 2022 sessions. We've got the, I just posted the links in the chat. We've got state sessions, um, 20 different uh, events happening in 18 different states. And we've also got three additional plenary sessions that CGLR is hosting Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Hope you'll join us for those. And we'll have another um, GLR Learning Tuesday session next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time with the Overdeck Fam uh, Family Foundation looking at digital digital STEM initiatives and innovations that can be used in out of school time. So join us for that. We're gonna be taking a little bit of break in August, sh showing some really high demand, high quality pre-recorded sessions that have um, happened in previous months. So you can join us for those on Tuesdays. Uh, but for now, I hope you'll just stick around and watch, as John said, one more Bright Spot video, this one coming from Hawaii um, about some of the great work that they've been doing during the pandemic. Thank you all, stay well, and hope to see you soon. I'm Leah Snyder from Patch, People Attentive to Children, a nonprofit organization that has been in Hawaii for almost 50 years. Patch's mission is to support and improve the quality and availability of care for the young people of Hawaii. Patch, together with Family Hui, is helping promote early literacy in the Maui community through lena.org, language environment analysis. Lena helps measure talk. Since 2020, Patch and our partnering agencies have enrolled over 100 families and registered child care providers in Lena. These Maui families and child care providers have learned the importance of early talk and how to increase conversational turns between themselves and their keiki to help build keiki brains and set them up for academic and life success. They've also been given tools and materials to help them continue to have meaningful conversations with the children in their lives. Patch and our partnering agencies have helped these Maui families and childcare providers with starting up home libraries. We've given away over a thousand children's books Mahalo for supporting the important work Patch is doing in our thriving community.